Welcome to a discussion of the membrane's structure and how it relates to its function of being selectively permeable. We are going to be uh, discussing how membranes work. These can be cell membranes or these could be the membranes that make up organelles, like say the lysosome membrane. Uh, fortunately, all those membranes really work the same way. Um, so if we were to discuss how a membrane basically looks, we could look at this kind of model cartoon here. Uh, and we see that all membranes would have a phospholipid bilayer as the primary component. We discussed that back in Chapter 5. Uh, there is cholesterol in membranes as well. I'm not really going to be talking much about that here. Uh, there are uh, also proteins in membranes. Lots of different types of proteins. Some proteins go all the way through the membrane, like this one right here. So your book wants to call those integral proteins. Uh, other proteins might just be on one side of the membrane or the other. So uh, these are just called sometimes peripheral proteins. Proteins. Um, and then there might be proteins with carbohydrate tags sticking off of them. Uh, we're going to discuss glycoproteins as well. Um, and, and there are just uh, all kinds of varied types of proteins, like those glycoproteins, like receptor proteins, which we will talk about in another unit. Um, and I'm going to be spending my time talking about transport proteins in regards to selective permeability. So there are lots of components to a membrane. There are even enzyme proteins sometimes uh, wedged into the, uh, the membrane as well. Um, um, but like I said, for our discussion, at least of selective permeability, I want to talk in particular about the phospholipid bilayer and transport proteins. And I really would want you to be able to walk me through the conversation of how both of their structures contribute overall to selective permeability. Uh, we're going to discuss in just a minute that the phospholipid bilayer is effectively the blocker of many types of particles, and that then transport proteins can be very selective about which one of those particles actually crosses through them. So let's go through that. Uh, if we were to focus on the phospholipid bilayer first, let's start discussing its structure. Uh, maybe you recall from Chapter 5 that they have very polar phosphate heads. Phosphates, again, were fully charged. Um, and so they're going to be facing out uh, toward the polar water that would be uh, surrounding a membrane, uh, whether it's a cell membrane or an organelle membrane. Um, so they're attracted to that polar water. And then the other major component of a phospholipid would be the fat part, or the lipid, um, which is very nonpolar, um, very hydrophobic. Um, and that's going to be the really important part for the phospholipid bilayer's functionality in terms of blocking. Uh, it's this thick, nonpolar middle that's going to be very effective at blocking anything polar from crossing through it. Um, it is extremely effective at blocking things that are fully charged. Um, for our purposes, things like sodium plus or, say, like Cl minus, um, anything with a full charge is really not going to be able to go through that uh, nonpolar middle at all. Um, is extremely effective at blocking them. Um, it's even effective at blocking uh, some semi-charged things like, say, water, um, which has the semi-positive and semi-negative uh, charges to it, or anything else with, say, um, an OH group like, say, sugars, um, are also going to be effectively blocked by the phospholipid bilayer. Um, the reality is a bit more complicated uh, in some cases, especially if a little polar molecule is especially small, it might be able to slip through um, a little bit on occasion. Um, but f uh, you can really think for the purposes of my course that polar molecules are blocked by the phospholipid nonpolar middle part as well. Um, and that they're, uh, in, in reality, traveling through transport proteins far more often to move in bulk. Um, there is one thing, however, that a, uh, uh, the phospholipid bilayer cannot block, and that's going to be anything that's nonpolar overall. Um, that can include uh, overall nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen. That could also include other fats. Um, especially steroid hormone communication molecules uh, that we might discuss later. Um, those can cross right through the phospholipids. Um, so it can't block everything. And uh, a metaphor that I often use with my students in the past is sort of like a chain link fence. Um, a chain link fence is very effective at blocking big things from crossing uh, to the other side, uh, but maybe little things like mosquitoes could still easily get across.
Okay, so if the phospholipid bilayer is a very effective blocker, then the other aspect to selective permeability is going to be selecting certain components to actually get through still. And that's what transport proteins are there for. Um, there are a, a huge variety of transport proteins in any membrane because just like enzyme proteins, transport proteins have very particular three-dimensional shapes uh, that might allow a particular type of particle to cross through it. In this little diagram here, they are showing little green hexagons that maybe are able to fit through this uh, type of transport protein. Um, your book calls this a channel protein that might have a little column of water running through it, uh, but it still does have a particular shape to let this particular particle cross through that channel. Um, this protein over here might be what's called a carrier protein instead. Um, I don't find the distinction all that interesting for my own purposes, um, but maybe it lets this type of particle uh, bind at a binding site. We don't typically call it the active site because we use that term only for enzymes, um, but just you know, binding at a binding site in the transport protein, and maybe in a carrier protein that causes the, the protein to change shape in such a way that the particle can then enter. Um, what's really important just for my purpose is just the overall idea that there might be uh, thousands of different shaped transport proteins um, all permitting their particular particle to cross and if a polar or fully charged particle doesn't have a transport protein to fit it then it's not going to cross the membrane. Um, that particle is just going to stay blocked. Uh, the other aspect that might just be worth discussing uh, very quickly is that transport proteins have allosteric sites just like enzyme proteins do. And so the other thing that a membrane might be able to achieve is maybe closing transport proteins temporarily to block the flow of certain particles um, and then maybe releasing activator molecules to open those transport proteins and then to permit the, the crossing of those particles. Membranes can perhaps let particles cross at certain times but not at other times and that's going to be important when we discuss the flow of particles in particular situations uh, for example nerve um, uh, ion flow is going to be something we discuss uh, a little bit later so um, I hope I've been able to communicate just the broad idea of selective permeability and how a membrane is made of two basic components. Both of those components have a particular structure that contributes to the overall function of selective permeability. You should be able to tell me what blocks and how it blocks. You should be able to tell me what selects and how it selects.